Okay, welcome everybody. We'd like to go ahead and get started. Please take your seats. Susie. Hi. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Freeland Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech Carillion, Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture Series. Uh, Mr. Uh, Strauss, Maury cannot be here this evening, but uh, Steve Strauss is here. We want to welcome Steve. Hi. Uh, glad to have you here. And we are uh, extremely grateful to uh, Maury and the Strauss family for the support of this lecture series. Before I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's guests, I want to put in a plug for upcoming talks. The next month is a little different. We're actually going to have two distinguished lectures in one month, which is unusual. Uh, nonetheless, December 5th, the next speaker is Dr. Ophira Ginsberg, who's director of the High Risk Cancer Genetics Program at the Perlmutter Cancer Center at New York University Langone uh, Health Center and uh, director of global health there. Uh, she'll be talking about social inequality and cancer survival, how we can close the gap. And then immediately after that, the following week on December 12th, our next speaker uh, is Dr. John Halamka, who's chair of the uh, Northeastern, uh, sorry, the New England Healthcare Exchange Network. He's chief information o uh, officer of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and professor, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he'll talk about what's next in digital healthcare. So coming up pretty soon, we have two really exciting additional uh, speakers in addition to the rest of the series, and we hope to see many of you there. Um, it is really a pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. This is a hot topic, uh, something I think just from the crowd, we can tell is something we're all very interested in and look forward to hearing more about. Uh, Professor Vicki Arroya is here from Georgetown University. She's the founding executive director of the Georgetown Climate Center at the Law School at Georgetown. And she also is a professor for practice at Georgetown, an assistant dean <coughs> for centers and institutes at the university. Uh, the Climate Center is focused primarily uh, on uh, dealing with state and federal climate policy and legal issues with respect to adaptation and mitigation with result uh, from the impending uh, and ongoing climate change. Uh, she also developed the director uh, and directs Georgetown's environmental law graduate program. Uh, Professor Arroya received her undergraduate degree in biology from Emory University uh, after growing up in Louisiana. Uh, she then uh, received her master's degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And from there, she went to Georgetown to receive her Juris Doctor degree. Uh, she served in many leadership roles. I just mentioned a couple uh, as vice president for policy analysis of the Pew Center on Global Climate Change, on the advisory board of the National Science Foundation Geoscience Directorate, She's chaired the executive committee of the Transportation Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences and uh, also served on the congressionally mandated study group for the future of interstate highway systems and reducing emissions from transportation <clears throat> in the transportation sector. Uh, she's been involved with the Economic and Allocation Advisory Committee of the California Environmental Protection Agency during the execution of the cap and trade program, uh, working closely with leadership in California to engage market forces to reduce emissions. Uh, Professor Arroya is Associate Editor of Climate Policy. She serves on the editorial board of Georgetown Environmental Law Review. She's an elected member of the American College of Environmental Lawyers. Uh, she was selected to the Green 100 by Poder Hispanic Magazine. She's a member of the United States Climate Action Partnership. She's helped develop the blueprint on design of climate legislation for the American Clean Energy and Security Act. Recently, she's testified both before the United States uh, House of Representatives and the United States Senate on issues related to environment and public works. So she has a, a very obviously important and influential career, and I just want to say I tried over the last few days to read a number of her papers and, and did read at least some of them and they're fantastic and actually a couple that really caught my eye recently, one published in the Virginia Environmental Law Journal uh, dealing with the issue, the title of the article is Upside Down Cooperative Federalism, Climate Change Policy Making in the States. And I think it really directs us, maybe we'll hear some about this, about the importance of actions that occur when you have a federal system that perhaps isn't taking the lead or perhaps even moving in another direction for the importance of states and local governments and what we all can do to contribute to this uh, issue. And then another one that may have a slightly more controversial climate what, uh, title, but what the heck, from Paris to Pittsburgh, U.S. state and local leadership in an era of Trump. And this is one that takes uh, the bull by the horns and addresses some of the issues that are sometimes uncomfortable truths and puts into place uh, an integrated look at policy, government action, and how we can deal with things that are going to affect us, our children, and our grandchildren. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Vicki Arroya.
Thank you so much, Dr. Friedlerner. Thank you all for being here. Wow, this is a great turnout. And I'm especially impressed for the students who have a test in here tomorrow. So thank you for joining us despite that. Um, it's so wonderful to be in Roanoke. It's such a beautiful part of the country and fall is my favorite season. So flying over the mountains was just breathtaking. And I picked this picture from the National Climate Assessment because I thought, I bet it looks sort of like this right now. <laughs> and I think I'm right. Um, and uh, you know, there's a, a lot not to be happy about about climate change, but I, I like to try to connect my talks to uh, place and to home, wherever that may be for people. So um, I wanted to start with an image that hopefully reminds you of home. Uh, just a few words about our Georgetown Climate Center. We launched over 10 years ago to be a resource for states who are in the lead on climate and energy policy. Uh, so we inform the federal dialogue in D.C. with the lessons from the states, and we serve as a resource to states, and also, I would say, to cities, especially on adaptation to the impacts of climate change. We work at the nexus of state and federal policy, so that's when I'm asked to testify, you know, using some of the lessons from the states, how, we, how might we affect uh, federal policy. And we support policymakers like some that you see in this picture through research, facilitation, and convening. Um, the folks in the picture include Secretary Ben Grumbles at the top leaning into the microphone. He's the Secretary of Environment for Maryland. Uh, you see some other folks including Phil Sharp, the former President of Resources for the Future who used to be in Congress, and Kelly Speaks Bachman, who used to be on the PSC in Maryland uh, with a, a private sector attorney. And that's the back of Gina McCarthy when she was the EPA Administrator. She came to Georgetown for several events that we had convened around facilitating uh, the collaboration of the power sector, um, NGOs and think tanks, academics, and her staff around the development of the Clean Power Plan in the last administration. And then finally, last but not least, we engage our students at the law school and the policy school and beyond in our work, which is really great. I consider it a privilege to work with them and to teach them uh, a practicum course that they can get some hands-on experience with. Um, externships, we do a week one simulation for first year law students so they get some experience outside of the big impersonal classes uh, with another center on our campus, O'Neill, that does health issues. We do a mock World Health Assembly simulation that they can participate in. We have paid research opportunities and postgraduate fellowships. So it's really wonderful to compare notes with the faculty here and learn so much about what you're doing. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to future collaborations, I hope. So for those of you who aren't schooled in the basics, I always start with a little bit of basis, basics on climate change. And as you can see from this 1912 article, we have known for quite some time, more than a century, that emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels, including burning coal, would lead to changes in climate as adding greenhouse gases in the form of carbon dioxide and others enhances a natural greenhouse effect. Uh, this article happened to be in New Zealand, but there were contemporaneous pieces published in uh, Popular Mechanics and in Australia. Key gases contributing to global warming from human activities are shown here. Uh, carbon dioxide, of course, is one that we think about a lot because um, it's the major uh, substance that's really causing the warming because it's emitted in fossil fuel burning, transportation, uh, emissions from power plants, and so on. Methane, though, is also very potent as a uh, global warming pollutant, and it comes from agriculture, natural gas systems, landfills, nitrous oxides, also for manufacturing and agriculture, and some uh, human-made uh, refrigerants and, and others that have varying potency and also varying lives in terms of the atmospheric life. Um, some of these can last for hundreds or even uh, thousands or tens of thousands of years once they're emitted, making tackling climate change much more difficult than conventional air pollution, which I worked on in the early decades of my career. Uh, so this is a chart of the ice core data from before 1958 and um, some measurements that were taken at Mauna Loa since then in Hawaii. And it shows uh, a spike uh, in the emissions and the concentrations, I should say, of carbon dioxide. Um, so that just gives you a flavor for what we're dealing with in terms of uh, quickly uh, rising concentrations to where we're going from pre-industrial levels of about 270 or 80 parts per million. And this chart could go much further back. Um, uh, to hundreds of thousands of years ago where it was relatively stable to now uh, over uh, 400 parts per million, as you can see. And correlated with that, uh, this is a NOAA graph uh, from the National Oceanic uh, and Atmospheric Administration showing global temperature anomalies and showing the upward trend in temperatures. And the only way that models can really replicate what's happening is to include 
greenhouse gas emissions as well as other factors including natural variation, sunspot activity, volcanoes, which tend to have a cooling effect for a little while, sulfate aerosols, which also have a cooling effect. The only way we can really nail what's happening in reality is to put all this in the models, including the greenhouse gases that humans are emitting, to really show uh, a similar trajectory as what we're experiencing. And global temperatures, as you can see, are increasing. The last five years have been the warmest on record. July 2019 was the warmest month in recorded history for our planet. And so along with heat, uh, we are seeing the energy that uh, that heat brings into our system causing major natural disaster events all around the world. Uh, because we work in the United States, I tend to focus on that in my talk. So 2019 is the fifth year in a row where the U.S. has experienced at least one, uh, sorry, at least $10 billion disaster events. So that's just based on disaster since early October. In 2017, you'll remember the names of some of the disasters from back then, uh, over $300 billion worth. Hurricanes Harvey in Texas, Irma, Maria, obviously devastating Puerto Rico, accounting for a large share. In 2018, there were 14 separate billion dollar weather and climate disaster events with a total cost of 91 billion. The total cost over the last three years exceeds $450 billion, so averaging $150 billion a year. And of course, these have included some major events here in Virginia. We're seeing this around the country. Uh, witness, for example, the California wildfires right now that are burning and far, far beyond. Um, floods, devastating heat waves, uh, droughts in some places. Uh, and of course, these events don't affect everyone equally, even though they are happening all around the world. Certainly our country has more resources to deal with uh, these changes than other places. Uh, in other places, they don't have those resources, um, so more people could die from these impacts. Uh, also national security and international security is affected uh, as um, people migrate to new lands and that causes friction. Um, no doubt some of you might be feeling the changes of climate change in your own life, in your own community, or might have friends or family elsewhere who've been affected by some of these storms. Um, my own family comes from New Orleans. That's where I was born and raised, and uh, our uh, family was affected by Hurricane Katrina. The helm on the top was my mother's in the Gentilly section, a racially mixed, uh, very middle class neighborhood. Uh, in uh, New Orleans, and you can see her house across the top affected both inside and out. That's not her car. She was legally blonde and couldn't drive. That was actually carried there by floodwaters that were up to the roof of that single story dwelling. And the house at the bottom was my sister Beth and her husband Terry's, and they lived near a, a, a canal that breached very early in that process. Um, it was really heartbreaking to see them go through that, to see my hometown go through that and to have them move in with me and see the pain that they were going through, not knowing whether or not they'd be able to return to the city that we all love. Um, my sister made the comment when she was trying to make a life in D.C. and thinking of whether or not it might work for them to stay, that she felt like she was in a witness protection program because she felt like she was plucked out of her life and put into mine. And it really didn't fit for him, them because New Orleans is full of characters and they really, uh, they really wanted to go back, so eventually they made it back to the area, not exactly to those homes, but back to the area. Um, some were never made whole, despite insurance, but they're lucky because they evacuated ahead of the storm, of course. Sadly, more than uh, 1,800 people lost their lives in Katrina for a variety of reasons, um, including those that lacked transportation or economic resources to get out of town. Some because of challenges with their own health, uh, if they had chemo treatment or other uh, need to be in New Orleans. Um, having seen other storms that ended up not being so much of an issue, uh, they decided to stay home and perished. Um, and uh, it wasn't completely a crazy move because just the year before in 2004, Hurricane Ivan we thought was going to be the big one and it was barreling tor towards New Orleans, but you might recall that that shifted and went to Mobile. Um, but the evacuation was really very stressful. My own father, Sid Arroyo, had been turned away from a medical appointment to check on his heart before the evacuation as hospitals were sort of going into lockdown mode. And my sister, when she went and got him from the hotel where he evacuated with my mom, took him directly to the hospital where he died that night. And I think the lesson um, that people took from not just our family's experience, but from the stress of uh, that very difficult evacuation where the contraflow didn't work very well, was that it was just too dangerous to leave. 
So I think um, I tell that story in part because um, I want people to know that uh, the people who stay behind uh, shouldn't necessarily be thought of as to blame for that decision because some people might think that it was a rational decision given what had just happened a year before. And fortunately, despite that experience, all of my family members, I'm happy to say, um, made it out in time before Katrina. So obviously extreme events can kill people um, and uh, a lot uh, of climate impacts can also make people very sick as well. Um, this Scientific American article just from September talks about uh, other vulnerable populations, I should say, across races. Um, the elderly were most impacted by Hurricane Katrina. Of course, races weren't affected, as we all know from the pictures. Um, in this article, it talks about children and pregnant women and the elderly being most at risk from extreme weather and rising heat. The article surveys and uh, details findings related to impacts in a variety of areas, including allergies, pregnancy, neonatal complications, heart and lung disease, risks for children, dehydration and kidney problems, skin disease, digestive illness, infectious diseases, mental health conditions, neurologic diseases, nutrition, and of course, direct trauma. So how is this affecting our home, Virginia? Well, Virginia's climate is changing too. We're feeling the temperature increases and an extreme uh, precipitation rise. Uh, events that have over two inches of precipitation are becoming more common, as you see from this precipitation chart um, on the bottom. You see the temperature increases on the top, and you see, of course, the sea level rise impacts and the tidal flooding in that part of Virginia. And these are just some headlines that capture some of the changes in recent years. Uh, storms like Michael, Florence, and Alberto hitting Virginia after, in some cases, going through many other states. Excessive heat warnings with heat indexes over 100. And drought. You might remember the flash drought that was declared just last month. And of course, coastal Virginia being very vulnerable to some of the major storms that we were just discussing and the rising seas. But you all and others like me who live in Arlington who are inland are also affected at times by major hurricanes. Does anybody know what an intersection this is? <laughs> Franklin Road, right? Is that right? So this was just a year ago from the remnants of Hurricane Michael that, that I'm sure some of you have stories about. Um, so uh, I wanted to share with you some uh, interesting research that's being done right now in uh, Richmond where I just spent some time. And uh, the science director of the Science Museum of Virginia, Jeremy Hoffman, um, shared some of these slides with me kindly. And he's working with young people, with students, on monitoring what's happening at ground level uh, to see how hot it's really getting and how hot different places in the city are. And just looking even at the uh, grounds of the museum, uh, what's different about where you have vegetation and not. So this young lady who was still in high school at the time was putting one of these monitors on the car so they could drive from neighborhood to neighborhood in a project called Throwing Shade, which is sort of cool. Um, and it's, again, like with the students here and our students, it's wonderful capacity building to do this kind of citizen science and to bring this in to uh, the work on climate change. So this is the plaza of the Science Museum, and it shows the parking lot and the plaza area and some trees and a not very well kept up lawn. Uh, who wants to guess where the hottest areas of this plaza or this picture might be? You, parking lot, right? And what about the coolest? Exactly, so um, here you see uh, image that was taken with an infrared camera and it shows the darker purple shade. Uh, the cool areas are under the trees where the temperature to the touch could be roughly 80 or 90 degrees, whereas on the asphalt parking lot, on the actual surface, it could get up to 180 Fahrenheit. And across different neighborhoods, just the air temperature surface level across different neighborhoods, there could be as much as a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference in different neighborhoods across the city at the same time, the same day. So you could see temperatures of the mid-80s, pretty livable, while other people were uh, experiencing over 100 degrees. Some of the areas that are most affected by urban heat island and adverse health effects are those who've historically faced discrimination with regard to housing policies. 
including discrimination and um, segregation to begin with, but also redlining practices. And this chart shows some of the redlining that targeted low-income communities of color, designating them as too risky for home loans and tended to then exacerbate and concentrate poverty and discrimination. And the Science Museum's Virginia, uh, Virginia's Jeremy Hoffman compared these redlining maps with uh, images today to show some of the impacts uh, in terms of asthma, poverty level, um, people without air conditioning, and you can see, no coincidence, that some of those areas that are in red on the redlining map from the 1930s are some that are most at risk for lack of insurance, for not having central air, uh, and, and tend to be uh, majority, minority kinds of areas of the city. And in fact, looking not only at Richmond, but in other cities with redlining, researchers are finding that 92% are warmer than other cities without it because of the lack of green space and too much gray and concrete, like we saw in that last slide. Urban canopy and parks provide so many benefits. They enhance property values, physical and mental health. They provide wildlife habitat, shade and cooling, storm water, water management, and so much more. And in its planning process, the city of Richmond is now conducting a climate vulnerability and risk assessment to evaluate the vulnerability of the residents and look at the built infrastructure and natural systems. Uh, you could see some of the indicators here that might drive some of the disparities across neighborhoods. And then as a result, target some of that investment in green infrastructure and vegetation and trees and such, also in services and assistance, certainly before uh, heat waves, or before power goes out or during or after extreme events like storms that knock people's um, power out uh, or for people who don't have cooling centers and make sure that people, especially the elderly and those with pre-existing health conditions can get to cooling centers which can really save lives. Heat brings risk to public health and especially those who conduct their work outside. This image from the National Climate Assessment shows projected changes near the end of the century in productive work hours in high-risk industries that rely on workers to be outside. Things like agriculture and forestry, construction, transportation, utilities, and more. And as you can see, the Southeast will experience significant impacts to productivity due to higher temperatures resulting in higher health risks. The map shows estimated percent changes in hours worked in 2090 under a high emissions scenario. Projections indicate that an annual average of 570 million labor hours would be lost in the Southeast by 2090. That's obviously a very scary thought, and maybe we should have had a reception, including drinks, after this talk. Um, and so I want to shift uh, to a big part of our work, which is trying to help states and communities avoid that future, both from the perspective of reducing the emissions, which we'll get to in a moment, but starting with some of the examples of how communities are preparing for some of these inevitable impacts, including in investing in some of the um, uh, green infrastructure trees uh, and other kinds of measures that bring multiple benefits. For those of you who are interested, we have an adaptation clearinghouse that's quite comprehensive. It has thousands of resources that show you what is already being done around our country and beyond. You can search also by state or community on the map. Do you see any uh, common theme of the map? What are the states that are actually taking action on climate change mainly? Coastal. Yes. Right, coastal. Even uh, some of the red states that are coastal are taking action in terms of planning because they're already seeing the impacts. But you also can see some of the western states that are facing, uh, and, and we see this more and more now, uh, droughts and fires, a uh, year-round fire season in uh, California, for example, and other states out west. So in these uh, clearinghouses and toolkits, we're trying to capture best practices and share and scale those up, including our green infrastructure uh, toolkit which shows um, how communities can use things like permeable pavements and uh, urban gardens and water barrels and uh, planting more trees. Um, there's a bunch of these resources that focus on how to invest in equitable climate adaptation solutions since, as I've mentioned, uh, these areas are not all affected the same. Um, my own hometown in New Orleans has a strategy on housing. Um, Louisville, I'm gonna share some information about, is doing some interesting work on urban tree canopy, um, and there's a lot of other reports that you can find on our website, adaptationclearinghouse.org. So again, just one example, uh, in Louisville, urban heat is one of the primary threats affecting public health and the safety of residents. The, Louis the Louisville Office of Sustainability 
commissioned a study to examine the urban heat island and identified neighborhood specific strategies and targets to help reduce the city's rising heat risk. The study found that a combination of strategies, including vegetation, cool materials like white roofs, green roofs, uh, energy efficiency, could yield very much uh, better health benefits in the urban core than any single management strategy. The city is encouraging residents and property owners to adopt these strategies, including cool roofs, green roofs, tree plantings, and they're raising awareness through some of these um, kind of social media uh, hashtag and other outreach that they're doing citywide. Uh, they also have worked with academic and design partners to connect the dots between sustainability efforts aimed at reducing heat and improved health and air quality. This project called Green for Good examined how adding trees as a buffer between some roadways that uh, have a lot of traffic can improve the health of nearby neighborhoods, including uh, schools in the community. So in this project, they did a pilot where they tested air samples and they also had students and faculty at a school volunteer to give blood and urine samples at a school alongside this highway. And the air monitoring after they planted the trees showed that under current certain conditions, particulate pollution was reduced 60% uh, behind the trees. And the health monitoring found some early signs of changes uh, at a cellular level. Um, this was only a pilot. They're doing a more extensive study, but just wanted to make you aware of this. And in general, Louisville it plans to plant more trees. They find that they provide $330 million in benefits annually. They provide $18.8 .8 billion of stormwater management. So they capture all that stormwater that doesn't end up in your basement. 6.9 million pounds of pollution, 5 million in energy savings, and 240 million in increased property value. So there are a lot of win-wins from these investments. So this uh, area of Gentilly is the area that I showed you earlier that my mom's home was in that was devastated in Katrina. Um, and now with the help of the resources from the National Disaster Resilience Competition, which was from, I should say, the last administration, uh, the city is developing a resilience district for the first time in Gentilly. And this funding is going to parks and recreation, to contouring some of the lots that were not redeveloped after the storm, so that they can hold some of the heavier rain that's falling now. Um, it's obviously not gonna deal with the kind of catastrophic flood that we saw from the levee failure of Katrina, but for some of the more routine floods, these kinds of parks and investments in green space and green streets can really make a difference. After New Orleans, the Hampton Roads region of Virginia is actually the second most vulnerable to rising seas. Norfolk is confronting climate change, including neighborhoods and at the Navy base. In 2018, Norfolk adopted a zoning ordinance update to enhance their long-term resilience of the built environment. And the ordinance includes a number of factors that developers need to consider in getting permits. They get points uh, for some of these investments in risk reduction, including elevating mechanical equipment, installing hurricane shutters uh, for energy resilience, uh, installing on-site solar and backup power and cool roofs, for stormwater management, they get points for installing green roofs, pervious, uh, in, impervious, uh, I'm sorry, more pervious pavement systems, I should say, that absorb the water, planting native vegetation and trees, and following the LEED standards for energy efficiency. So other municipalities, including Roanoke and Arlington and others, can build on Norfolk's work by updating local zoning ordinances and increasing awareness on how to reduce vulnerability uh, and incorporate these into design considerations. Boston is working with developers to uh, integrate a checklist to build resilience in their buildings there as well. Because we're based in Washington, we do a lot of work with DC. It allows us to also integrate that experience in the students' lives and they get to actually meet and work with clients and people in the community. And we've done some work in recent years in Ward 7, which is the box on this uh, chart. Uh, near the Watts Branch Tributary, which is flooding more. It's part of the Anacostia River systems. And this was one of the regions of the district that's been identified as having the most socioeconomic vulnerability of the impacts of climate change, in part because of that flooding, along with heat. You see some of the social indicators of risk there in terms of unemployment levels, educational attainment, um, age, et cetera. <clears throat> Our group at the Climate Center at Georgetown convened an equity advisory group that included members of the public and uh, involved them in implementing the DC climate plan. 
one of the things that we learned from that process is that it probably would have been better to incorporate the community input before the climate plan as opposed to on the implementation side. And um, we learned from them a lot of their priorities, which weren't necessarily as focused on what they thought of as more future problems like potential flooding from climate change, but current day problems that are facing their neighborhoods like being able to have jobs for people when they come out of prison or training their youth on uh, skills that can be used, whether it's installing solar roofs or installing some of these kind of green infrastructure solutions that we've been talking about. And so we've integrated uh, their ideas into work in implementing the Climate Action Plan and are now doing some work with them in the city and the utility on creating a resilience hub in Ward 7. Um, we can't adapt, though, our way out of the climate crisis. We do have to actually take action to reduce emissions. So I want to spend most of the rest of our time together talking about tackling the causes of climate change, which is so critical. So U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by sector are shown here. You can see some good news in that the electricity sector emissions are falling in our country, in part because of the shift from coal to natural gas, but also in part because of the reduced prices and um, plentiful use now of renewables uh, more and more over time, in part driven by policies like production tax credits and other policies like renewable portfolio standards in states, which I'll get to in a minute. But you can see that transportation emissions are rising and other areas are relatively flat or are rising. And of course, these pollutants are global, so we can't do it alone, even if many of the states in the U.S. or all of the states uh, work together. Uh, we need international and national policy action. So um, you can see some pictures here of an event that I had the pleasure of being at, the Paris Climate Talks. And the top picture, of course, was when the world was declaring victory momentarily because in 2015, uh, the world pretty much came together and established a framework that would try to hold emissions to well below 2 degrees Celsius or ideally 1.5 degrees. They uh, talked about mobilizing $100 billion of capital and they set a goal of reducing to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the second half of the century, basically bringing in the end of the fossil fuel era. They also started working on adaptation and putting it on more equal footing and focused on recognizing health to vulnerable populations, food security, et cetera. Um, our role in these climate negotiations, because we work with states, including Virginia um, and other states, was to bring governors and have them present at side events, including this one that you see with Governor Jerry Brandt, Céline Royale from, uh, from France, uh, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, now famous because he ran for president and tried to make climate a central issue of the election, and Governor Shumlin, uh, who was then governor of Vermont. So that was during the Paris talks, and then the year after, Governor Terry McAuliffe came with us uh, to really try to push back on the new administration's position that we should get out of the Paris Agreement. So you see our governor of Virginia at the time there with Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. You'll recognize Arling, Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger at the end with his colorful tie and socks and um, again, Governors Brown and Inslee. And we helped facilitate the governors before um, President Trump announced that he was going to pull out of Paris, but when there were rumors that he was going to do so, we helped facilitate some letters from governors, bipartisan, to urge uh, the U.S. to remain in the Paris Agreement, citing the impacts that the states and cities are already facing and the fact that they're making these shifts to clean and renewable power, seeing jobs created, seeing a lot of win-wins that they could articulate. But as you all know, it didn't really work. So in June of 2017, the Trump administration initially announced that it would withdraw from the U.S.-Paris Climate Agreement. And of course, just this week, the Trump administration started the formal process to withdraw because it, uh, it, they couldn't do it before now. Um, this gives one year, the clock ticks, and after around this week uh, in a year, uh, after the next election, as it turns out, uh, we will officially not be in the Paris Agreement, we, we will be the only country in the world not signed on to the Paris Agreement. And in addition to that, um, we are seeing the federal government rolling back some of the policies that would have reduced emissions in line with what was required, including former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, who rolled back the Clean Power Plan. And um, you see that the Clean Power Plan that we were helping with uh, when Gina McCarthy was at that table at Georgetown some years back, including with input from the states and power companies themselves, 
would have reduced emissions 32% from 2005 levels. That's out the door now. They've also started to attack the standards to reduce emissions and fuel economy from vehicles. So the Obama administration already had done one round to make the uh, standards more efficient uh, for cars and harmonize with California, which long has been able to lead the country. Those standards were harmonized and uh, were well on their way to being met. And a new set of standards of 54 miles per gallon by 2025 were going to come online. Uh, this would have saved drivers $1.7 trillion over the life of the program. Of course, there's tremendous air quality benefits as well. But the new administrator of EPA, following uh, Trump's lead uh, when he said he was going to cancel, quote unquote, Obama's actions on vehicle standards as well, issued a proposed rule that would freeze the vehicle standards at 2020 levels, so like just next year, through 2026, with no increase at all. Now, this hasn't been finalized, but what they have done is revoked California's authority to set greenhouse gas standards and also to set standards for new zero emission vehicles. 23 states and many cities have already sued to challenge this action. And again, the vehicle standards rollbacks will have major implications. By 2030, Americans will be spending $36 billion more each year on gasoline. By 2030, 250 million additional barrels of oil and greenhouse gas pollution equal to 30 coal power plants uh, will be emitted because of this. And we're seeing these rollbacks already in terms of uh, a trend that had existed before where we were seeing some reductions in the emissions uh, is now being reversed. The rollback of the standards and other policies um, and growth are leading to uh, increases not only in carbon dioxide emissions, as you see here in 2018, but in economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions that rose between 1.5 to 2.5% in 2018. So the U.S. commitment in the Paris Agreement was for us to reduce our emissions by 26 to 28 percent below, below 2005 levels by 2025. But the best estimate is that we're currently at 10 to 11.6 percent below 2006 levels, 2005 levels, sorry, which leads significant work for us to do over the coming five years. And of course, a lot of these policies are taking us in the exactly wrong direction. So who is leading? Well, fortunately, the states and some very major players in industry are trying to fill the gap that's being left by the federal government. And immediately after President Trump announced that he was going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement back in 2017, the U.S. Climate Alliance was launched by three U.S. governors and expanded to where now it covers roughly half of the governors and over half of the U.S. population and over 11.7 trillion of the United States gross domestic product. If the Climate Alliance was a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world. And these are governors who are pledging to try to reach the targets within their own jurisdictions that we signed on to in Paris. Similarly, we're still in launched as a coalition of businesses, cities, colleges and universities, healthcare organizations, faith-based groups, states and tribes, also um, pledging to try to meet the Paris Agreement standards despite the lack of federal rules and implementation of the, clean, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and America's pledge pledging to honor the U.S. reductions. Cities are stepping up with the Climate Mayors Group, ad announcing a statement to adopt, honor, and uphold the goals of the Paris Agreement. Within days of the announcement of Trump uh, pulling out of it, 211 had signed on, and now we have over 400 signatories. So the cities and states and firms are really trying to fill the gap. Not everyone, though, so it's clearly not enough. Um, but I will say that the majority of states, including a lot of red states as we think of them out west, have for some time now had renewable energy standards that have been quite popular and uh, often survived assault from the right that have been attacking them in some states. Uh, a lot of these states have actually made the renewable portfolio standards even more aggressive because they were able to meet and beat the, the targets that require a certain amount of the power, the electricity to be sold, to be from solar and wind. Uh, Texas, for example, has been a leader in this area, as well as California, and a lot of the more usual suspects. Uh, you will see our state is not painted in there, 
But I'm thinking that after this week's election, that might be something that changes. Um, we shall see. But uh, I, I think we have some good news, and I'm going to get to that in a minute um, in Virginia, just based on our own work with the state. So for those of you who want to dig a little bit deeper into what's happening in Virginia, you can log on to another tool I want to make you aware of on our website, the State Energy Analysis Tool, where you can see what's happening in your state and other states in terms of what sources of fuel we use in the power sector. So here you see Virginia next to West Virginia, which is obviously very reliant on coal, and where our emissions stack up compared to theirs. Um, and you can do their uh, profiles and um, see how much generation of natural gas, renewables, and coal we have. And uh, again, you know, talk to elected officials and try to compare notes on what we can do to try to make sure that we're shifting to cleaner energy as much as possible and as quickly as possible. U.S. states and cities are also exploring strategies to cut emissions from the transportation sector, which is the largest sector of emissions. And it's been the hardest nut to crack because it really involves all of us and it involves land use decisions. So you see this progress report from work that California has done to invest in more sustainable communities in terms of land use and the design of our cities. Transit's a big part of it, and also moving to new electric vehicles, both for transit and in your personal life, can make a difference. So fuels, vehicles, um, the, the land use space, it's complicated and all of us are involved, but we have to do something to reduce our transportation emissions. One of the solutions that states have found on a bipartisan basis to work together and send a market signal is a cap and invest program like we have not been able to get off the ground at the federal level, at the state and regional level, through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So this has now, for over 10 years, covered the CO2 emissions from power plants in this region, from Maryland up through Maine. And it was recently extended to 2030, and it will reduce emissions another 30 percent. So that will have reduced emissions 65 percent from the sector by 2009 levels, in conjunction with some of the other market shifts that we were talking about earlier in terms of shifting from coal to natural gas in part because of the big natural gas fines in recent years. Reggie implementation, because it has had a modest price signal, has generated $3.2 billion in allowance proceeds that then has mostly gotten invested in weatherization programs, in renewables, and then as a result, it's actually lowered the electricity bills in this region. It's also created 44,000 new job years, which is how they count years in the renewable field. And energy consumers overall, households, businesses, government users, have enjoyed a net gain of 220 million as their overall energy bills have dropped over time, even while the economy has grown 47%, outpacing the rest of the U.S. Reggie, as we call it, has improved air quality throughout the Northeast region and brought major health benefits, including uh, avoiding hundreds of premature deaths and tens of thousands of lost work days. Independent analysis has also found that the economic value of this health and productivity benefit has been estimated at $5.7 billion. So it's really quite successful. And of course, again, the last governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, started uh, through an executive order to ask the Virginia DEQ to set up a cap and trade rule that could be linked with REGI in the last administration. And our Georgetown Climate Center actually supported the state's work in that analysis. DEQ eventually gained approval from the Air Pollution Control Board to propose a draft regulation, and Governor Northam directed DEQ to follow through on that rulemaking. So they developed final proposals, and the rule became effective, or should have become uh, effective, per the State Air Pollution Control Board back in April of this year. But it was stopped in its tracks because the Republican General Assembly passed budget language on May 1st, shortly thereafter that effectively prohibited the state from implementing the rule until after 2020. So I'm thinking that now with the election, uh, we will be able to really revisit this and that by the time they can move forward with a new budget, that language will be taken out. And so we will just see a postponement in when Virginia can move forward with its carbon rule and linkage with Reggie, um, which will be a really very happy day for a lot of us who've been working on it for years. 
But again, the transportation sector is the source of even more emissions and it's growing faster. So one of the efforts that we lead um, in terms of facilitating state engagement with each other at the Georgetown Climate Center is the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which has been an initiative of um, several jurisdictions that originally started north of Virginia just as an accident of the groups of state highway and transportation agencies who meet over time. And over time they decided to go from just working together and comparing notes on things like clean vehicles and fuels and freight movement and developing more sustainable communities through land use patterns to really trying to launch a regional conversation about reducing emissions. We had listening sessions last year that included 500 people from throughout the region and 100 state officials to take their input on what they wanted to see in a low carbon transportation future. And we took that input and uh, started to work on an announcement at the end of last year. And before the states even made that announcement, Virginia said, hey, can we join? And so you see Secretary Matt Strickler there from this administration at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco last fall. And so Virginia, I'm proud to say, as a Virginia now, became the 13th jurisdiction in the Transportation and Climate Initiative, just in time so that they could actually join this announcement that was heralded as a landmark agreement in the Boston Globe and in other uh, outlets because uh, they joined a group of states that were pledging to design a regional low carbon transportation policy proposal that would cap and reduce emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels and allow each TCI jurisdiction to invest proceeds into a low carbon and more resilient transportation future. And so we've been working really hard this year. As you can imagine, it's a really heavy lift. We've had even more big public meetings in Boston, in Newark, in Maryland, in Baltimore. You see some of the pictures of the public engagement and the state leaders who were engaging with the public, including Chris Bast from Virginia DEQ right there in the middle, um, and that's uh, Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Earl Lewis from Maryland. The cool thing about TCI is that it involves the agency heads from the transportation agencies as well as the energy and the environment agencies. And as you can imagine, on an issue like this, the governor's office is in many cases as well. We have a public portal that's open for public comment, so I encourage you to weigh in. We're getting hundreds of comments uh, from all across the spectrum about what the community wants to see in this program. And just last month, the states announced a framework that people can comment on. Uh, and their intention to move forward with a draft memorandum of understanding by the end of this year, as they promised last year. They'll be taking continued public input on that draft MOU, and a final MOU is due out in spring 2020 for those who choose at the time to sign on. The states would then, per the Reggie experience, develop a model rule together, go through rulemaking, and program implementation. Other action in Virginia, I want to just give a shout out to Governor Northam for his leadership on resilience, signing executive order number 24 that's trying to make the state more resilient to the impacts that we've been talking about, including doing a vulnerability assessment of state-owned buildings, preparing for the impacts of coastal adaptation, implementing something that was actually in legislation and a position that was created by the state legislature. And you see Admiral Ann Phillips there standing beside him along with Secretary Strickler. Uh, working to create a coastal resilience plan. The state's also supporting local governments with guidance so they can meet their own uh, planning goals as well. Just in the last month or two, Virginia's made two announcements, including through an executive order that 30% of Virginia's electricity will come from renewable energy by 2030 and 100% will be carbon free by 2050. This is an executive order, but I will say again, after the election, I think we might see Virginia becoming yet another state that might have some of these aggressive targets in legislation. Maryland has them in legislation. Massachusetts has them in legislation. Those are Republican-led states that are actually moving forward. Uh, if, you, if you look at the governors, uh, they're actually moving forward because there is legislation on the books and um, those governors are moving forward with their climate commissions to enact that legislation and to, to, to uh, actually put rules in place to actually meet those aggressive targets over time. I was uh, pleased to be invited to an event in Northern Virginia at George Mason when the governor announced that he is uh, planning on contracting to get 30% of our energy for state operations in Virginia by 2022, just around the corner. That's more power from renewables 
for our state buildings and operations than any other state. So we do see some leadership at the executive level that's making a difference. Um, along with Dominion, they've announced that they're gonna put 1,000 electric school buses on the road. And of course, Virginia took some of the um, money from the VW settlement to replace the old diesel school buses with electric school buses. This was something that was very popular in those big public sessions because it brings additional health benefits from the lower PM for the kids riding in the school bus, but also from the community. I'm pleased to ride uh, and drive an electric car. I drive a Chevy Bolt. They're a lot of fun. They're very quick and peppy. Um, but, uh, but, it's, but, but, but for long distance trips, it's a little tricky because you've got to sort of map up your route and make sure that you've got some charging infrastructure. So Virginia's making some progress using some of that VW Dieselgate scandal money to put in charging infrastructure to make it easier. So finally, I just want to end on some notes of local leadership. And I believe we have some people in the community here that probably know more on this because they might have worked on this. Um, in Roanoke, you all have a climate action plan that you see here. The city of Roanoke is working on reducing emissions for major sectors, including buildings, transportation, et cetera. I understand that folks came from Blacksburg and I met with some of you earlier, so grateful that you made the trip and grateful for those who are watching online. Um, the public engagement uh, is, is highlighted in the Blacksburg uh, climate action plan that I read. Um, and there are uh, uh, efforts now to really make these plans more than just something that's sitting on a shelf. The Civic Center that we passed on, on, on our drive here uh, has achieved a 30% energy efficiency boost through a major retrofit. The city is also embracing electric vehicle technology with some gently used Nissan Leafs. The trolleys are efficient, et cetera. Um, there are ways to get involved with these processes and hopefully we can hear from people in the community about what that might look like, including revisions to the climate action plan and weighing in on those statewide goals that I just mentioned. Uh, with the help of Nell Boyle, who's the Sustainability and Outreach Coordinator, I got access to some of these websites that I wanted to share with you so you could find ways that you can get active in this community. Is Nell here by any chance? Yay, Nell! Thank you for your help. So talk to Nell, she's really the expert. I'm not the expert on Rowan <laughs> So in closing, I just wanna say, it's really up to all of us to look at our homes and our communities and try to find ways to not just survive, but to thrive in this new world, whether it's buying an electric vehicle like I did with my husband John, or um, planting trees, or being on the Forestry Commission, which I actually voluntold him that he needed to do to try to save some of the mature trees, um, or coming to our TCI meetings. Uh, please really do your part, um, vote, uh, and, and please try to uh, keep some hope that we can really tackle this problem. If we do it together, I'm really convinced that we can. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Vicki. Fantastic and provocative talk. We uh, have time for a few questions or comments. Please, uh, when I call on you, stand up, ask your questions so everybody can hear. Yes, please. You know, I have to say, I haven't really personally worked so much on the pipeline issue, and I haven't um, been as involved in that. Uh, I, I did read about the tree sitters and was impressed as, again, a person who was thinking that I might start sitting in trees in Arlington to just stop them from being cut down. Um, I will say, I have found this administration and the last administration to be uh, easy to talk to, and I would say somebody like Chris Bass, who I think is from the Roanoke area, might be a good place to start. Um, I would also say, especially again, again, given the recent election, that elections matter. So, you know, you can also obviously talk to your members of the legislature as well as some of your local representatives. Do we have city council members and others here? Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, that's just not an area that, that I work on. But I will say that we do have to deal with supply as well as demand. Obviously, a lot of these standards are going at trying to reduce our demand for fossil fuels, but we have to deal with the supply as well. 
Uh, before I ask, I'd like to ask a question if I may, and it's, it's a legal one, and I'm certainly not a lawyer. Maybe you can help. I remember back to the days when the arguments about states' rights and federal rights uh, with respect to integration in schools, and, and uh, <clears throat> depending on where people stood on that issue, seeing uh, the perceived heavy hand of the federal government to try to enforce uh, the United States Constitution and states battling with it. Now we have a flip situation, and we have states, as you showed us, taking a lead, and the federal government coming after them because they don't want them to set the standards. And I, I'm not quite sure, is this something that's going to end up in the Supreme Court, and wh where is this going to go in terms of states being able to take a lead if the federal government doesn't want them to? No, I'm going to thank you for that question, because one of the things that I didn't mention, there's just so many things to talk about, right, in terms of, like, the rollbacks, but what I didn't mention is this outrageous suit that the Department of Justice filed against California just a week or two ago to try to stop them from moving forward with their cap and trade program that I did help with, as you mentioned, um, and we didn't, I didn't go into detail since we're not in that region, but that program has been successful since 2012, and it's linked with Quebec, so they tried to say that it's an interference with the a foreign government negotiation treaty authority of the U.S. But that suggests that the U.S. is actually doing something in our international dialogues. And as you can see, we have left a big vacuum because he just announced this week that he's pulling out of the Paris Agreement. So I really think it's going to be hard to make an argument that there's preemption because the, uh, the federal government is obviously not occupying the field. Um, the states also are pretty creative and they're smart in terms of having good lawyers uh, who are trying to avoid um, complications of challenges around the compact clause, which would require Congress to have to give the imprimatur, if you will, to uh, agreement of states. Uh, that was another line of argument in the DOJ suit uh, in California. And um, they also uh, sue under dormant commerce clause grounds. Um, but, you know, again, I mean, California and these other states have very smart lawyers and uh, are very aggressive in defending state prerogatives, and I'm really hoping that this administration will eventually see the light, because I will say there's a real inconsistency on some areas that they talk about states' rights when it suits them, but in this case, it doesn't. Okay. Other, other uh, questions? Yes, uh, please, Steve, go ahead and stand up, please, and shout your question out. Yeah. You know, building codes and standards uh, make a lot of sense, and we really have to address that. And um, by reducing emissions from what kind of fuel you're using on the front end for electricity, including moving to zero sources of emissions, you know, solar and wind, for example, um, that helps increase efficiency of building so you don't have to rely on that much energy to begin with. Um, but then when you think about it, where the transportation sector comes in and will keep growing is that we're really burning a lot of oil. And so even if you uh, deal with some of these building issues, which are huge, um, you really have so much dependence on that one fossil fuel. So if you think about it, if you electrify vehicles and we're already shifting to cleaner sources of electricity, that really can give, get us the really dramatic reductions that we need to see by the second half of the century. So I think that combination of the policies, both the efficiency of buildings and operations of manufacturing, along with the shift to cleaner sources of electricity and electrifying more of our vehicles is really what we need to do. I have time for one more question right here. Yes, please stand up. It appears that the future path for power is renewables in the form of solar and wind based on your conversation. You didn't say anything about nuclear mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, so nuclear is a carbon-free fuel, and uh, right now it makes up about 20% of our por portfolio, and to shift away from it will almost inevitably increase our emissions of fossil fuels because renewables don't have the kind of battery storage backup that we need, although battery storage technology is evolving. I'm personally not against nuclear power. I will say that it's quite expensive, and so far in recent years it's been really impossible to get new plants off the ground economically. States are actually paying a lot of money to subsidize and bail out some nuclear power plants right now, whereas wind and solar power, their prices are really cost competitive now and beating out fossil fuels. So it's not that from a climate change perspective I have anything you know, against nuclear. Um, I think maintaining the existing nuclear fleet as long as possible while we can shift away with fossil, from fossil fuels and advance energy storage technologies is really important. But economically, we just don't see nuclear coming on as, as viable. Um, there might be some other solutions that are more kind of mobile or smaller. Uh, Bill Gates talks about sort of modular nuclear, but obviously there's also a lot of you know, NIMBY kind of reaction to nuclear that might make that impossible to cite. Please join me in thanking Professor Royal for a great talk. <laughs> <laughs>